All right, so it's uh, it's four o'clock, so let's get started. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you guys are. Um, this uh, very short session that I wanted to uh, take as part of uh, Soumya and uh, Nandini's excellent small coach uh, initiative is uh, is basically how to cook delicious food super fast. Now, some caveats here. Uh, there's a good chance that many of you are probably already good cooks um, and that you know how to make delicious food. Um, perhaps some of you even know how to make it really fast. Uh, you have your own optimization methods and so on. So um, the idea is hopefully that there's something in this for everyone from the beginner uh, to a seasoned cook uh, to actually pick up. Right? Uh, as for my credentials, I actually have none. I'm not a chef. I'm not a professional cook of any kind. I just cook daily um, and um, I like experimenting with food. and uh, I like experimenting with food science. Um, so what I've essentially done is to put together a few things that I think uh, uh, will be relatively broadly applicable to most people who are uh, of Indian origin and like cooking Indian food. And perhaps those who are not uh, Indian and would really like to get into Indian food um, as well. So, um, so let me, since again, I come from the corporate environment, so I had to do this as a PowerPoint presentation. So, so there we go, right? So number one, um, Indian food per se, right, and uh, is, is tremendously diverse. Um, every state has its own unique flavors, uh, every region, um, and uh, there's tremendous diversity. Uh, sometimes the West tends to know Indian food only through the lens of a narrow category of uh, Punjabi restaurants, uh, thanks to Punjabi immigrants uh, in the 1960s and 70s in Europe, UK, and US. Uh, uh, and the British idea of curry being this ubiquitous red gravy type thing uh, that represents all Indian food. Yes, of course, there's tremendous diversity. Right? Um, so, but there's some historical background to why Indian food as it's made at home in India is labor intensive. Um, and my personal theory in terms of why that is the case is that historically Indian cooking at home uh, for a lot of us, historically, has been somebody else's job. Uh, usually either a mother or wife, um, or if you're really rich enough, maybe a, a cook. Right? Um, it's usually somebody else's job. Right? And when it's somebody else's job, we never think about optimizing it. We never think about uh, you know, figuring out gadgets, figuring out methods uh, to make those people's lives easier. So we rarely do. Right? So to quote uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus from Veep, right? um, if men got pregnant, abortions would be available on an ATM machine. Right? So one is that it's always been treated as somebody else's job. The second um, aspect of this is that being a tropical country, um, we have a natural uh, risk aversion to actually storing anything uh, because things go bad very quickly. Right? Now, I live in China. Right? Um, even good kind of you know, bacteria or fungi-based uh, infections, say the one that turns your milk into curd or, uh, or your bread or your, your sort of uh, leavens your bread, um, happens in 30 minutes. Right? In most colder climates, it would take two hours for it to double in volume. And in Chennai, bread will you know, bread dough will double in volume in literally 30 minutes, right? Because um, th these are the right conditions for bacteria and fungi. So in general, historically, again in the pre the, um, sort of refrigeration era and all that, there has been this tendency to always prefer freshly cooked food because there is absolutely no saying what old food will do to you, right? That said, there is a rich history and tradition of of uh, eating fermented food uh, and so on. But for most part, in general, there is a preference for freshly cooked food, right? So there is that. Um, then there has also been an inherent mistrust of technology. Um, again, it's, it's a combination of factors. For most part, kitchen appliances arrived very late uh, in India. Right? I mean, you know, uh, we got our first refrigerator in the mid 1980s. Um, and for 10 years after that, uh, pretty much the only thing it was used for was storing dairy because you know, milk, and, milk is really what spoils really quickly. Um, and you know maybe some perishable vegetables and that's it. Right? It was never used for storing leftovers or anything else. Right? Even pickles used to be stored outside. But the idea of pickling was to make something that wouldn't spoil for a long time and does not need refrigeration. Right? Um, so this essentially means that uh, uh, a lot of Indian home cooking really does not use the refrigerator in a meaningful way that other countries use, especially places like Europe um, and, and US where uh, Technology and refrigerators have been around for a longer while. So it has been sort of integrated into the process of cooking a uh, lot more naturally. And this is a bit of a force fit. Although people living abroad definitely store leftovers in the fridge and eat it. 
Um, and it's often people who live in India would say it as a, you know, a matter of pride that I don't eat leftovers. Uh, I don't put stuff in the fridge. I really finish and eat everything, right? As if that's something to be proud of. Um, but what is interesting is that there is also another aspect. If you go to an elect electrical appliance shop and look at refrigerators in India, you will find that they have smaller freezer sections because Indians apparently don't use the freezer, which is a terrible thing because a big part of the stock is actually about how you can actually become a faster and uh, and actually make better food by utilizing the freezer more effectively. So that's one part of it, right? Um, and you will find that there's the, the refrigerator design in India, you know, uh, prefers to give more importance to the regular refrigeration section and not the freezer at all, right? In fact, there's a specific design of refrigerators in India where they keep the freezer harder to access at the bottom, you know, freezer on the bottom sort of thing, because, you know, people want to mostly use the main uh, cabin of the refrigerator and not the freezer at all, right? Um, all of this essentially means that uh, we are somehow missing out on not just the storing of leftovers part, we're actually missing out on aspects of prepping ingredients, which is very common in even Southeast Asian or uh, for that matter in the West, particularly in the West and particularly in the traditional French or the European style of cooking, where you never cook from a blank slate. You're always using a prepped ingredient and that prepped ingredient for all intents and purposes is either refrigerator or frozen. Uh, and this does not mean that you can't make fresh food at all. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, right? So there is, so this is that background, right? And in, on a lighter note, I mean, there is also this typical tendency, um, again, to literally always uh, have this bias that somehow fresh food is better than what, uh, arbitrary definition of Indian definition of fresh food is, is better uh, than other kinds of uh, food or food that has been made with, uh, you know, prepped ingredients. Um, and so on, right? So let me kind of then therefore give you a quick background into uh, what is it that we're actually trying to learn from Western or more engineering or a, uh, what restaurants tend to do in order to really optimize their workflow and make food really fast. What we want to learn from the Western, apply and adapt it to Indian cooking uh, to make our food taste better and actually also you know, you know, uh, be able to complete it fast is I have to give you a very two minute introduction to how this Western idea of cooking, which again goes back to the formalization is basically French cooking, right? It pretty much all other styles essentially treat the French culinary um, education as being important, right? I mean, obviously they then apply it to their own styles. Even if you're a Mexican chef, you still get trained in the French way of cooking and then you adapt it to Mexican food or uh, you know, Italian or whatever, right? So one of the key concepts that we will particularly use here as I talk about this is this idea of what we call a mother sauce. Uh, which is that in French, there are five mother sauces. You know, you, you, I don't have to read it to you, bechamel, velout, espanol, tomato, and hollandaise. These are five different sauces with different textures, different tastes, made from slightly uh, uh, different ingredients. The intent of these sauces is essentially something that you can prepare ahead of time. And then when you need to make a dish, you take the main ingredient, you pour the sauce on top, and your dish is done in a very simplistic way. That's the simplest thing, right? But definitely as a, a more seasoned chef will take the sauce and then add more ingredients and improve upon it. Uh, add more fresher ingredients uh, to layer the flavors on top of this core sauce to make more complex uh, flavors as you go along, right? Again, the simple principle being that in, in typically either in a restaurant in India or for that matter anywhere in the West, you never start from a blank slate in most cases. And not starting from a blank slate is actually the first uh, thing that helps you with speed. So we'll kind of see how this applies here, right? So the first is sauce. The second thing is this idea of a stock. A sauce is actually more of a thicker, highly flavorful uh, kind of gravy kind of thing. A stock is a more watery liquid. Um, essentially, if you wanted to make a large volume of something, uh, you add stock, right? In a typical Indian sense, a, a typical stock in the day-to-day -day Indian kitchen is actually the water that you cook your dal in has a tremendous amount of flavor or the water that you pressure cook your rajma in has a tremendous amount of flavor. So, you know, uh, 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 your grandmother would never throw that out. Um, and so would actually use it in other dishes or within the same dish to, to add more flavor and so on. So again, in the West, the idea of a stock is, there are four kinds of stocks. You have a white stock, a brown stock, a seafood based stock or a vegetable uh, based stock, right? So again, based on different uh, ingredients in different styles of cooking, a brown stock would use the Maillard reaction to get more flavors out of the ingredients, be it meat, red meat, or, or the onions or carrots that they use. And ultimately, and then there are many variations. So stock is more like a liquid, uh, 
that you pour in order to uh, make more of your dish, right? So that's instead of adding water, you add a stock because this is water plus flavor. Okay? So that's basically, so these two concepts, the reason I want to uh, sort of introduce these is because these are relevant to what I'm going to be talking about, right? So coming to our main, you know, uh, sort of point that we're trying to make. The keys to speed and deliciousness, deliciousness are prepping and layering of flavors. Okay? Um, and naturally, again, it bears mentioning that a naturally good cook understands these ideas, understands flavor layering, right? Um, just watch, uh, uh, just watch your, your mother or your grandmother cook and they, they will be, you know, sort of uh, doing this naturally. Uh, tempering is an example of flavor layering where you add a whiff of the, the flavor of those spices right at the very end uh, by frying them in really hot oil or ghee uh, so that you get that flavor of that dish up front. Right? because we've been cooking it for a while. So a lot of the volatile molecules tend to sort of disappear over time. And so you're reminding everyone that this is still, yeah, this is the taste that I want you to get, right? So this is, this is, this is not, none of this is new, but what we try to do is to really take this engineering approach of trying to learn um, and adapt uh, from the West. And again, uh, I sometimes uh, um, hear from people that, uh, you know, we, we have our own traditional ways of cooking, you know, why should we borrow and adapt? But to be true, you know, we've been borrowing ideas forever. Right. Yeah. Literally, the chilies and tomatoes and potatoes are not even in, in natively Indian. They were introduced by the Portuguese, and we now integrate them into our uh, into our cooking. Right. Um, cooking methods, uh, cooking ingredients. Uh, if anything, India is, is is a place where we relentlessly borrow and adapt um, and evolve. Right. So, so in that sense, um, we will look at what techniques from the West are worth adapting here for speed um, and deliciousness. The second thing is that the key to actually prepping is better use of your refrigerator and we'll, and more specifically freezing. Okay. And we'll talk about that, right? And the last one is keys to flavor layering are actually taking that French ideas of sauces, stocks and flavored oils, but applying them to Indian cooking. Okay. Now, um, one of the things I often do is um, I, when I go to a restaurant, Sometimes I will just coolly ask the waiter or saying that I would like to talk to the chef and I'll say that, can I, can I come into the kitchen and observe? Nine times out of 10, they will tell me, no, you're not. Honest. This is, this is no, this is confidential. We'll not let some stranger in and so on. But sometimes they do, right? And it's actually quite remarkable. In an Indian restaurant, a typical Indian restaurant, um, speed is everything, right? Um, if you've tried to make a dal makhani at home, it takes you hours and hours. Uh, you order a dal makhani restaurant, it gets to your uh, table in under 10 minutes, right? So how do they do that? Okay. So, and actually some of the flavors a good restaurant will have, you will not be able to get that level of intensity of flavors at home. Of course, barring in mind that you might argue that it's actually unhealthy and all that, but we're not talking about healthy, we're talking about flavor. So let's first talk about, uh, let's take a typical dish. Um, and again, this is a generic algorithm of sorts, uh, broadly applies to a vast category of gravy type dishes um, in India. Uh, again, this is not specific to a region, small ingredients may vary, but this is broadly the principle, right? So, you know, you want to make a gravy of some kind that you might want to eat with rice or roti um, in India. Uh, you're going to start with oil. You want to heat the oil. You want to use some whole spices, could be jeera, could be mustard, could be curry leaves, whatever it is that is regionally applicable for you. Uh, you want to add onions, um, ginger, garlic. Um, again, some of you may not eat uh, uh, garlic. That's fine. Uh, and chilies, again, optionally. Uh, and then tomatoes. Uh, so this in some sense is a very standard, most common base. You may or may not add any of these individual ingredients, but this is just a sample example, right? So if you want to make a dish or a gravy dish in India from, from scratch, this is a general formula, right? Once you do that, um, then you add your main ingredient. This main ingredient could be a vegetable, a mix of vegetables, could be meat. Um, and depending on what it is, um, it might require some preparation, right? So um, something like potatoes, in many cases, you might want to boil or pressure cook ahead of time to save time. Uh, because if you add the potato straight there, you might need to cook it uh, for a longer period of time. Um, likewise, meat, uh, so red meat might take a longer period of time to cook um, and so on. In some cases, you might want to brown or fry the meat before adding, again, something that uh, the difference between an aloo gobi made in a restaurant and an aloo gobi made at home is that you will add the gobi either directly or just steam it. But in a restaurant, they will deep fry the gobi before adding it to the gravy, which is way more tasty and unhealthy, but definitely tasty. Okay. And then at some point, you'll have to decide, do I add water? Or do I need a more tangier gravy? So I, I add some kind of yogurt plus water. Or depending on the region, you might want to add coconut milk um, and so on. And then optionally, you might want to think about how to thicken it, right? In some cases, you might not need to thicken, but in other cases, you might add some thickeners, right? 
um, either some kind of starch, it could be corn flour, it could be anything, it could be rice flour, it could be nothing at all, right? Uh, then naturally, the gravy may already be thick at that point. And then finally, you do tempering, and again, optionally, you might add some fresh herbs. So the traditional way of making a dish from scratch in India is, is this. This applies to a good chunk, good percentage of uh, kinds of dishes you might make with whatever regional variations. And in general, um, this tends to, you know, this is the sort of time it tends to do, so between five to 10 minutes based on how you do your uh, uh, entire thing. In fact, if you really want to get a really flavorful ginger, onion, garlic, tomato, uh, chilies based gravy, uh, you need to at least cook it down for 15 minutes at lower heat. Uh, uh, and so on. So in fact, five to 10 minutes is what typically people end up doing, um, leaving a, a little bit of flavor uh, on the table, but this is essentially what tends to happen, right? And then you add your main, you know, water, yogurt or whatever it is, and then any anywhere between five and 30 minutes based on what is it that you're cooking. Um, if you are actually cooking something like a black urad dal as part of dal makhani, you're gonna cook this for around 30, 40 minutes, easily. Okay? Um, and again, uh, you do tempering as per your region and so on. Right? So when you really think about it, so uh, two things that we want to talk about. How do we make this process better, shorter? And while at the same time, I actually want to make the food tasty. So here's what I want you to sort of uh, keep in mind, right? Uh, some broad flavor layering principles in Indian cooking. So one is that ingredients need time to blend with one another. So what I mean by time is that if you cook ginger, onion, garlic, tomatoes for five minutes, that flavor that you get in that gravy is very different than that same thing cooked for about 30 minutes at slower heat. Uh, because the flavors mix uh, a lot more, the flavor profile is a lot more integrated. Okay, okay so, there, so this is number one, right? So there is a, there is a natural, core, I mean, inverse correlation between time, I mean, actually positive correlation between time and flavor. Longer the time, in fact, the better the flavor, more integrated the flavor. That's number one. Second thing to keep in mind is that spices actually dissolve better in fats and alcohol and not water. A lot of spice volatile molecules, the ones that your nose and your taste buds actually taste, um, actually end up dissolving in the oil that you add. Right. So the spices that you add after you add anything that has water is only going to get partially uh, used in your dish because it's going to get a more muted response because spice molecules tend to dissolve uh, better in fats and alcohol. In fact, while European cooking, after the first, uh, they will often use wine um, or any kind of alcohol in cooking because it brings out more flavors. Uh, also has the advantage of in case you're using a non-stick, if you're not using a non-stick vessel um, and you get things stuck to your bottom, adding alcohol is a great way of removing all those things because those things are delicious. Uh, before you let them burn, they add a delicious flavor to your uh, this thing. So that's why deglazing with alcohol. I mean, actually, even when you're making Indian food, you know, keep uh, a bottle of uh, really cheap wine uh, or uh, a cheap vodka or something, add a little bit of a splash and it makes a big difference, actually improves the taste as well. So that's one, right? Um, third thing that I want you to remember is that when spices work together and in, in Indian food, it's quite unique, right? So if you find your European cooking, they focus on one or two primary flavors coming through. Indian cooking, on the other hand, uh, garam masala has like some, you know, depending on whose secret recipe it is, can have upwards of 10 individual ingredients inside the garam masala. Okay? And on top of that, we'll add jeera powder, dhania powder, and all the rest of it. Okay? So we add a tremendous number of flavors. A lot of Indian cooking relies actually on this complementary working of these spices uh, together, right? As opposed to overwhelming us. Okay? So, but the interesting thing is that if you add them all raw, uh, it will be overwhelming. So, which is why we cook them over a longer period of time. And that's why a lot of Indian cooking is labor intensive. Okay. Uh, so what is interesting is that once you cook spices and ingredients for a longer period of time, their individual flavors actually get muted. Okay. So raw garlic is very garlicky. Okay. Garlic cooked for 30 minutes is a more muted, milder garlic taste. Still tastes garlic, but it's more muted and more milder. You may or may not want that. In some cases, if you're making some lasuni dal palak or something, you want that strong garlicky taste, which is why you'll add, fry some you know, garlic at the end and add it. So that you want to bring the garlic up to the front because the ginger garlic paste you added when you started the dish would have got muted by the time you, you get that. Right? So this is one thing to remember. Okay? Muted flavors tend to work better as a background. Again, the metaphor that you know, uh, I will use often is music, which is that you want to think of your dish as, uh, as what's, who's the lead vocalist, uh, who's, the, who's the lead guitarist, um, and the keyboardist, and then who's playing in the orchestra and the bass guitar, uh, 
uh, behind the scenes. And I'll keep using this metaphor again and again uh, to drive this point home, right? The fifth point is actually that acids highlight flavors. It's important to understand what's an acid um, in, the, in the context of cooking, right? Lime juices is acid, vinegar is acid, yogurt is acid, tea is acid, um, uh, also tamarind is strong acid, right? So anything that tastes sour is actually an acid. Okay? Um, what is interesting is that if, if your dishes do not have sourness, okay, um, they end up tasting one dimensional and they, we use a very simplistic term like bland, but more interestingly, they taste one dimensional. But what I mean by one dimensional is that acids highlight other flavors. It's like this. If you're making something with karela, which is your bitter gourd, right? It is a bitter taste. If you used, if you use no acid and just use bitter gourd on a dish, right? It would be tremendously, uh, it would be bitter. It, and the only taste you'll get is bitter. You add other things, but the bitterness will really just stand out. The moment you add an acid, what it does is that it highlights all the flavors that exist while also being sour as well. So you don't, you're, you're literally distracted from the bitterness that, that is still around, that's still there, right? So likewise, uh, where you observe your grandmother squeezing a bit of uh, lime juice at the end of a dal, which is just, you know, dals are largely, lentils are largely tasteless. At least tuar dal is tasteless. Chana dal is more flavorful and so on, right? Uh, Adding that acid at the end really just brings the whole thing together, right? So that's, that's basically what an acid is. Interestingly, you could experiment with acids. It doesn't have to be lime juice. You could add pineapple juice. Any, most fruit juices are actually acids. Okay? Uh, you could experiment with your own ways by adding pineapple juice or orange juice um, or even apple juice for that matter. It's a more milder acid, malic acid and so on, right? So the sugar and salt actually amplify flavors, right? So they're more like the volume number. Okay? Um, Acid is more like the uh, cameraman who turns the camera to another place. Hey, or, you know, sort of takes the camera back and says, hey, look at the whole thing, right? Uh, salt and sugar actually is the volume now. Okay. Um, you add a pinch of uh, salt, we all know, right? So you take something like cardamom powder and put it in your uh, tongue. It will just, the only thing you will taste is actually bitter. Your nose will still smell cardamom, but your tongue will just taste bitterness. Let's take it with a pinch of salt and it will just transform or, or a pinch of sugar, right? So salt and sugar end up amplifying flavors. So which is why any good dish will need to have a both salt and as well as a little bit of sugar. Does not have to be white sugar. You can, you could add honey, you could add fruit juices, you could add jaggery, many ways in which you can introduce sweetness to your dish. Okay. Now, the next point is that you want to highlight a strong flavor. Um, you shouldn't, there is a range in which they have to be cooked, right? But not too much. Um, if you want to, if you want a strong flavor of, as I said, garlic or something, then you shouldn't overcook the garlic, right? So um, just brown it just enough so that uh, um, you get that flavor and so on. And again, again, last but not the least, tempering is something that, you know, Indians have been doing for a while. Tempering is an Indian technique to impart it muted flavors, not strong flavors. Think about it, right? You're actually taking a ton of mustard or jeera and curry leaves, and dro dropping it in hot oil. And you might think, isn't, isn't, aren't all of those flavors going to overwhelm you, right? If, if you don't put it in the oil and try to eat it, it's going to taste quite intense, right? Uh, but by putting in really hot oil, you are quickly dissolving all the flavor molecules and actually for most part destroying a fair amount of the flavor molecules to get a more muted flavor. That's the intent, right? You don't want to overwhelm the person, but you just want to give them a whiff of what the is. More important thing that the tempering actually does is add texture. You know, the crunchiness of the jeera or the mustard or a crisply fried curry leaf in added at the end or fried onions and so on. That's really what adds interestingness. Uh, and texture is actually an important element when you think about flavor itself, right? Um, you might think texture is just physics. Why does it impact flavor? But anyone who's had a limp potato chip versus a crisp potato chip, they're the exact same thing chemically. Uh, but we know what a crisp potato chip tastes like. It tastes way better than a limp potato chip because crunchiness is also something that our brains perceive, right? Last element uh, before we you know, go to the, a lot of the uh, examples that I will give you is this fact that sometimes um, modern research also tells us that nostalgia itself plays a role in how you perceive flavors, right? Why people are like fond, have fond memories of their you know, mother's curd rice or grandmother's dal or uh, you know, uh, grand aunt's uh, chicken curry and all that is because when strong memories are associated with taste and when you eat something and it reminds you of that, it will always uh, taste better, right? So there is no contest for your grandmother's dal simply because you can't compete with nostalgia, right? So it has nothing to do objectively with taste at all. It may have very well been an ordinary dal, but it will still taste better to you because of the nostalgia. So it's important to remember this. Also, okay? So now 
what I want to do is introduce you to an optimization method uh, for Indian cooking. Um, three things. Uh, two are important. Third one is actually optional. Um, this idea of base gravies. Yeah. Very common in restaurants. Uh, you go to any restaurant, they will have three or four base gravies. Okay. Um, in fact, the reason a restaurant can have a menu where which will have a uh, chicken Kolapuri, chicken Nawabi, chicken Hyderabadi, chicken Lahori, and some you know twenty variations of that is largely again because they have different sauces that are already made. And uh, depending on how busy the restaurant is, they will make the sauce in the morning and use it for the rest of the day. And in some cases, they will refrigerate or freeze or refrigerate. Right? Freezing is generally important. Here, okay, so. Think about this, right? So one of the things I do regularly, not, not necessarily all the time, I'm not necessarily all these five. This is just a, giving you some five indicative tastes. And by the way, if any region is missing here, this is just meant to be an indicative list. Uh, by all means, there is, there, is a, there is a base Bengali gravy, there is a base Oriya gravy, there is a base uh, a Telangana or Andhra, Andhra gravy or a Karnataka gravy. None of this really matters. This is just a sample set, uh, just to get your ideas flowing, right? Um, so if you take a typical generic North Indian based gravies, your oil, onion, ginger, garlic, tomato spices, what you do at the start of a dish, essentially what you're doing is that you do it at larger scale on a weekend, take a big pot. Um, you don't necessarily have to worry about, uh, it's, it's, it's about adding all these uh, spices, low heat, adding water and let it cook for one or two hours. You don't have to worry too much about it, it on low heat, just wait for it to get there and then you just blend the whole thing, filter it, fill, strain out all the ingredients because in two hours, by the way, all the fibrous part of your spices, tomatoes, onions, and all of that are just tasteless husks. Uh, there's no point in keeping them. You don't lose anything. Okay? So filter those out and just keep the sauce. Just keep the thick sauce and put them into ice cubes, ice cube trays and freeze them or put them into cups uh, that are you know, the right size when you make a dish and so on and freeze them. Right? Put them in your freezer, right? Now, so you could make variations, right? So there's a generic onion, tomato, ginger, garlic based gravy. There is a makhani gravy, which is more tomato heavy, but uses uh, perhaps cashews as a thickening um, agent and uses butter uh, to give a slightly sort of more unctuous mouthfeel and so on, right? Uh, you could think of a malabar gravy, which is coconut oil, shallots, you know, ginger, garlic, curry leaves, spices, and use coconut milk instead of water and so on. You could have a chetinad gravy, which uses grated coconut and a spice mix that specifically also uses fennel because that really brings out the chetinad uh, flavor and so on. It could be a richer mughlai or a khorma gravy, which is more ghee, onion, that's not red in color, so you won't use turmeric, chili powder, or tomatoes. Use onion, ginger, garlic, cashew paste, and use cream, and that white base that you see in like a navratan khorma and so on. Now, these are base gravies, right? So these are things that you do, you refrigerate, you keep them. Um, and then the second element of this is what we call stocks, right? Stocks are essentially um, the water part, right? So normally when you make a dish, at some point of time, if it's not a dry dish, you need to add water. What is more flavor heavy than water? Stocks, right? There's basically water plus a lot of flavor molecules from this. So stocks could be red meat stocks, could be white meat stocks seafood stocks and vegetable stocks. So I, I think, you know, I mean, you could Google on how to make a stock, but a typical Indian way to actually make a stock if you don't have an oven and all that is to just mildly brown, um, in case of meat, brown the pieces of meat till they to get the Maillard reaction going. So it's the right amount of brown. Then once it's brown, you make sure that you add uh, some kind of liquid to make sure that you get all the bottom things deglazed and get it into the gravy because there's a lot of flavor there. Then you add all the, uh, any other flavoring that you might want to do. Again, some mild spices. You don't need to over spice your stock. Um, again, as we said, spices don't dissolve much in water. So you might just want a little bit of a hint of uh, a specific uh, spice if you want, uh, etc. But typically, if you're using red or white meat stock, you don't need any other flavoring. It has enough umami uh, tastes, uh, glutamates in them in any case, right? Uh, especially seafood stock, prawn stock, for example. The best part about prawn stock is actually that uh, normally uh, when you buy prawns, you're probably buying it, you know, the shell. Right. Uh, you're buying them without the shell, right? Um, uh, convenience, right? It's, it's a pain to remove the shells. Ask your ask your fish guy to give you uh, all the shells, because shells are, have a tremendous amount of flavor. They're unfortunately, in inedible directly because of all the calcium. But when you put them in um, in, in in a big stock pot and extract all the flavor from the shells, you get a extraordinarily tasty seafood stock, right? like nothing else. Okay? Um, likewise, vegetable stock, right? Uh, typically, you use onions, uh, vegetables like onions, uh, ginger, garlic, uh, uh, carrots, and so on to add uh, a lot of flavor 
uh, to your vegetable stock itself, right? So this is uh, base gravies and stocks. So the, the, the third idea, again, this is optional that I want to introduce you to, is a Southeast Asian idea of using what we call flavored oils. This is in contrast to tempering. Tempering is taking spices, putting them in really hot oil, um, and then adding it uh, to give you the whiff of the taste. Flavored oils, on the other hand, are actually a mechanism of adding a very strong flavor. Okay? Uh, this is something that you can prepare ahead of time. right? And how you flavor an oil is actually to heat it to a very, very low temperature, not high temperature at all, because then it will, it will burn the spices or uh, you will actually get a lot of acrid taste that you don't want. It's very, very low heat. And these essentially think of the spices as slowly letting go of their flavor molecules to the oil over an over a eight, nine hour period. So you have to let it steep, right? And then once it's done, you store it in a dark uh, bottle somewhere, filter out all the spices because now the spices are just empty husks. Okay? So you literally get oil. So for a Bengali flavored oil, so let's say mustard oil and punch foran, you discard all the stuff, you get oil that now will literally smell like Calcutta in that sense, right? So likewise, you know, uh, in, in China, they will use sesame oil, chilies and garlic uh, infused chili oil, right? You go to a Chinese restaurant in the US, you're going to get that chili oil and everybody will get off oh, this dish is bland. Let me take my flavored chili oil and add it and it's delicious, right? Likewise, I mean, and the possibilities are endless. You could make a dhaba tadka based flavoring oil, right? And by the way, none of these ingredients will remain in the dish. This is just the flavored oil. You filter out everything else. You filter out all particles at the end of it, right? You could have a Malabar flavored oil added to any dish, any Kerala style dish you're making or a Chetinad flavored oil uh, and so on, right? And then there are some, obviously there are some interesting creative ingredients uh, that, that I've observed, things like vinegar pickled uh, ginger. Delicious. Um, the, the acid in the, the acetic acid in the vinegar actually mutes all the strong heat of the, the ginger while letting the flavors really come through, right? Um, again, same principle, use of acid with a strong ingredient sort of really just balances the whole thing out. Fried onions. I mean, anyone who likes biryani knows that fried onions make a fantastic addition to any dish. Uh, garlic chips, uh, very, very underappreciated. Uh, the only key thing is that you could very easily burn garlic. Uh, so you have to get the temperature of the oil exactly right and the time that you cook it uh, exactly right uh, to get this right. right? So, so now let me sort of get you to the, the meat of the story in terms of um, what's the new workflow once you have these things in your fridge, once you have these things in your fridge, right? So here is where flavor layering becomes important. Okay? What you're doing in this new way of cooking is fundamentally to say that now when I'm you might ask me that, well, if you're using a base gravy, which is right at the bottom, um, why are you still using oil and spices and the onions and ginger and garlic again? The answer is that the flavor that you're actually getting from the base gravy is a more muted background taste. The, what you're adding fresh is a more upfront, sharper taste. And so therefore, when you make, when you have a base gravy, you don't have to use as many onions as you would otherwise need to use just a half an onion, one tomato, just a little bit of ginger garlic. All you want to do is bring those tastes up to the forefront as well as the background. So that, that's why restaurant food tastes more intense than what you cook at home. Because on top of the more muted flavors that exist in the base gravy, they end up reintroducing those flavors just a little bit in, in prepping the dish again. And you do this at very high heat. You don't have to like sit and wait for 10 minutes. Once you add the base gravy, you know, sort of uh, make sure it loses a little bit of water. You add your main ingredient and instead of adding water, you're going to add some kind of stock. Uh, red meat stock could be a vegetable stock. It could be a, a seafood stock, depending on your choice of dish and so on. But then again, you might say that, you know what, I'm, I have very strong flavor. I'm just going to add water. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. You don't have to use every one of these techniques in every dishes. But all I'm saying is, that when a restaurant wants to really knock you out with an intense flavor, this is what they do. They use a base gravy. They add your main ingredient, which is also prepped, by the way. You know, a restaurant will mass, bulk, uh, boil, uh, things like that, and so on. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, frozen vegetables as well. Um, that um, it's important to realize that frozen vegetables, um, in many cases, are actually fresher than what you would consider fresh vegetables. Because a frozen vegetable is usually is frozen uh, in a shorter time after being plucked from the plant than a fresh vegetable, especially if you're in a city, it travels a long time, a long duration exposed to the elements before it gets to the shop. Okay. And so therefore, um, in many cases, this, this idea that a frozen vegetable is not fresh is completely wrong. Actually, in many cases, frozen uh, vegetables are fresher. Uh, and so therefore, you, another speed technique here is that if you're using 
uh, frozen peas, frozen corn, and so on, they are actually much fresher, right? So you should consider embracing uh, frozen vegetables because they save you a lot of time. Um, and then you add your stock, and then you ultimately either you can do tempering or perhaps um, you could also use a flavored oil, right? Uh, particularly in, in dishes like, say, a dal, uh, where anyway, tor dal is not very flavorful at all. Um, and so on. So you could you could out you add this sort of last bit of bomb uh, flavor bomb by adding the flavored oil um, at the end, right? In addition to whatever herbs you have, right? Not just coriander. You could add uh, basil or any other uh, uh, kinds of leaves as well, right? So when you really think about this, you could actually get a dish in under five minutes uh, under this method, assuming that well, a, all you need is half an onion. You maybe you make the oil. In some cases, you're too lazy. Ignore all of it. Add a little bit of oil pour the straight base gravy and go from there. Every one of these steps is actually optional, right? You would get a dish out in like five minutes, right? Um, especially if you're making something like, a, um, say, a butter chicken kind of thing, just take the makhani sauce. You don't need to add further uh, uh, tomatoes and onions and chilies and all that. It needs to be creamy. Just get the base gravy, add your cooked chicken or uh, in paneer, just you know, chop it up, add it. And then you do your tempering or you do your flavored oil, um, add stock to really, uh, Add a little bit of stock uh, so that you really just make the flavors pop um, um, and then and you finish it off, right? So in summary, right, the whole idea of speed and flavor is, um, is that you've got to consider prepping these base gravies that we spoke about, right? So it could be a typical North Indian gravy. It could be a typical Malabar or South Indian or Chetinad uh, style gravy. It could be a Korma style gravy. Depending on whatever you have, you have some two hours on the weekend. It doesn't need much as uh, supervision. It's a big pot, low heat, let it cook, and then you blend it. Uh, if you don't have an immersion blender, which is very useful, uh, put it in a big mixie and blend it once it cools down uh, and filter out all of the stuff, the spices, the rest of the husks and the fiber part of vegetables. So you get a, just that clean, creamy kind of stock. Uh, so the base sauce itself, right? Um, and then you freeze them. Um, if you're making stock, don't freeze them because they're too inconvenient to, for it to it'll become a solid block and it uh, becomes complicated. So you just have to refrigerate stock. So you're largely fine, right? Stocks are not that high on flavor, but they're definitely more flavorful than water. Okay? Um, and so you literally replace water with stock when you cook. Okay? Um, and then always, as I said, make sure that you strain the base gravies because the fibrous husks have no flavor left in them. And frozen vegetables are often fresher. Uh, than fresh vegetables, right? Um, and again, as I said, always feel free to experiment. Um, as you know, as I've often found that uh, if you are someone who has no uh, dietary restrictions, right? Um, I find that using meat stocks in what would otherwise be considered a vegetarian dish makes a big difference. Um, so, it, it, especially using things like prawn stock or using uh, 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 one of these base gravies makes a massive difference, right? So always think of, think of it that way, right? And actually, even if you're vegetarian, right? Now consider using uh, uh, stocks uh, that have umami flavors in them, right? So use mushrooms. Mushrooms are a tremendous source of umami, right? Um, umami essentially is, uh, is savoriness that your uh, taste perceives uh, as a result of uh, glutamates, which is a, which is a active, glutamic acid is a amino acid. Uh, that your body actually needs. And it mostly makes it itself. It's not an essential amino acid that you need to eat. But uh, unfortunately, you know, glutamic acid and glutamic salts, glutamate salts, when they hit your tongue, they're delicious. Um, and meat has a lot of glutamates. Parmesan cheese has a lot of glutamates. Uh, tomatoes have a lot of glutamates uh, and so on. So therefore, uh, think of ingredients that add savoriness if you want that savoriness, right? So, so that is my very quick rapid fire uh, uh, session. So maybe now we can do a few questions and then, uh, yeah, let me give me one second. Let me unmute.